I'm Fancy. And I'm Colleen. And this is Murder by Design. All right, guys, grab your glass of wine because you don't want to miss this interview with Joseph Scott Morgan. Um, and I'm going to leave it up to you to kind of guide me through this because I'll be honest with you. I do not know a whole lot about um, the autopsy of Lacey and Connor and what it means. Um, I focused more on um, the psychological aspects of this. So um, I kind of looked at it from uh, the point of... Uh, I read Dr. Robbie Ludwig's book, the um, uh, the killer spouse, you know, the the and and, right. and talked about that kind of spot. And I kind of went through, you know, him being a um, a temper tantrum killer and a pregnancy killer, and that was kind of my take on the whole thing of what he lined up with those two things. So, but I know that you know a lot, you know, about the specifics of why this would or wouldn't be, you know what happened in the water. That's kind of what I'm looking for tonight is to talk about, about those things. And Colleen said, I guess she said that in some way that you believe that what, what happened didn't happen in the water, but that you believe that there was some timeline issues of some sort. Uh, I don't, I don't know that I've ever been necessarily uh, out of whack with the timeline. Uh, and the mm -hmm. reason is, uh, and certainly based upon her body, you can't necessarily make a determination as to what we refer to as the uh, uh, PMI's post-mortem interval. Um, it's, it's very different because her body was so very compromised uh, when mm -hmm. she was, you know, finally recovered. Of course, they recovered uh, Connor's little body first. Right. And there's always been some confusion uh, to their findings relative to him. Uh, mm -hmm. there was, uh, you know, some indication that, uh, I think that there was some tape associated with his body, uh, yes. that was found adjacent to him. There's mm -hmm. any number of reasons I think that that could have happened. And it's very confusing. I, you know, how did the tape become associated with him? Uh, particularly if, if people are to believe, which many people do, that his birth is what's referred to as a coffin birth. Uh, yes you know, when decomposition sets in and, you know, we can mm -hmm. go back to the Watts case with this and, and listen, mm -hmm. the Watts, Watts case is certainly not the first, the first case of a coffin birth with, um, you know, obviously uh, you have to have a pregnant woman in order to fil facilitate that. And we'll go back to that in just a second, but mm -hmm. uh, just so folks at home understand um, as as it, with a, a baby that's in utero like this, uh, the baby is part and parcel of, to of the totality of the mother at that point. So their their systems are essentially bonded together. And we're not just talking about, uh, you know, the baby being dependent upon the mother for uh, nourishment and, and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. We're talking about the structural integrity of the body. So let's just think about the body actually being contained uh, within the placenta, within the womb, and as decomposition goes by, or, or advances, uh, those areas, those, and I, I use this to describe this to, to my students. If people at home will, you don't think of this term a lot, other than in some kind of social justice context, people think about, uh, you know, uh, things being uh, desegregated, okay, or disintegrated, I'm sorry, disintegrated. Um, mm -hmm. If you begin to think about as opposed to being integrated, uh, where you have uh, systems that are bound together at a molecular level, you have disintegration. And so with disintegration at a molecular level, things begin to kind of pull apart like this. And mm -hmm. as that happens through the process of decompositions, uh, decomposition, the the those tissues lose their ability for containment, and it's very simple. It's not, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a person with a PhD to figure these things out. But as that begins to break down, 
Mm -hmm. You have this loosening that takes place. Now there's another compound that comes into this. You know, let's let's keep in mind where her remains were found. Well, Connor's first and her and sure. his mom. Uh, this is a very harsh environment. I started my career off working in brackish and salt water uh, yes. down in South Louisiana. Uh, now mm -hmm. they don't have the tremendous heat up in that area that we have in the south along the Gulf Coast. And that water is cold, but it's not cold enough to preserve a body. And sure. on a more, kind of a more gory perspective, uh, you have to think about the aquatic life because there's feasting, post-mortem feasting that goes on with these bodies. So you've got all of these things playing in together. You've got normal decomposition. Uh, then you have uh, the effects of the salt water on the body in this environment. And then you have animal life. And because we've never actually seen these images, or I haven't, I'm not, I'm assuming they're probably floating around out there as sure. you tend to on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, her body would break down. Now, if, if she shows up uh, in the water, okay, and let's say she has been, uh, and one of the things that has to be factored into this is that if she sustained, and this might be where Colleen was getting this from from me relative to the timeline, if she sustained some kind of anti-mortem injury, say there was a massive head injury, if her throat had been cut or she had been stabbed or these types of things, that those insults as or injuries, but we refer to them as insults, those are only going to quicken decomposition because you're right you've mechanically broken down the integrity, the structural integrity of the body. Mm -hmm. So all of the little nasties that are out there that, you know, are going to attack us even at a microscopic level, right. they have been feasting a lot quicker. And mm -hmm. so uh, with marine life as well, you have, you're inviting, it's like ringing the dinner bell. And I hate to be so morbid, but that's just the hard, the hard, hard reality. Back. Right, yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just one of those things that occurs. Mm -hmm. Now the the limbs that were torn torn off um, the and some say that it was you know there was cut cutoffs at her elbow, um, her knees were severed. Now is that something that that you believe would have happened before going into the water, or do you think that that's something that the water that the water did? Because I know this has been a, a, a a subject of contention for people is is whether the water could have done the damage or was it something that happened you know before her going into the water yeah that's that has been a, a bone of contention and no pun intended but let me <clears throat> let me give you an idea and we, we won't talk about Lacey at this point we'll just talk about um, a body okay um, bodies do in, pa in fact come apart uh, particularly in these aquatic environments, you will have you will have bodies that um, that you will find intact, even. And mm -hmm. I've had this occur to me, where I have gone and these are but these are bodies that have been in the water for a protracted period of time. And I've worked cases where people have been floating for eight, nine months, sometimes. Uh, the, the tissue itself begins to literally tenderize. And I'm not just talking about externally. You'll have this occur at the joint connections and these sorts of things. So I've gone to pull bodies out of water and parts of bodies have come off. And no, it's not just skin slippage. It's just not like the top, the epidermis of the skin that we call degloving. This right. can actually happen when you pull the body. So this mm -hmm. is... This is what I think, based upon the fact that the forensic pathologist has not necessarily, that there's still so many questions about this. Mm -hmm. If the body had been uh, dismembered prior to going into the body, there, into that body of water, there would have been definitive tool marks on the bones in order to have facilitated this. Now, one of two things happened. Either those tips, those ending ends of the bones had been gnawed on mm -hmm. by aquatic life and that had been compromised sure. and they couldn't appreciate it. 
mm-hmm. or there was just there was nothing there uh, okay. to appreciate. And so that's that's the rub, and that's mm-hmm. that's where that's where confusion can come in. Mm-hmm. And and then you get you know you got to keep in mind and kind of uh, frame you know frame this. This is you think back to Scott Peterson all those years ago, and when this case normally came up, this is where court TV made their bones. I mean, this yes, is, absolutely. Uh, so you had ru- rumors and people that were floating around with all kinds of ideas, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, and people made careers off of this case. So there mm-hmm. was all kinds of wild speculation that was floating about uh, back then. You know, if, mm-hmm. if this case happened today, yes. I don't necessarily know that it would gra- draw the same level of in, mm-hmm. uh, attention. And I'm not trying to diminish mm-hmm. the life of, of Connor. Oh, no, no. Saying right. That's the nature of the world that we live in, you know, now. Now. Uh, because there's, there are absolutely, you know, we, we always think that nothing, uh, you're not going to be able to surprise me again. And as sure as you say right. that, something's going to happen. I was just covering today on Law and Crime this, uh, uh, can't remember the fellow's name now, but anyway, He's getting ready to be sentenced, and it's this this the Iowa farmer that killed mm-hmm. his wife with a corn rake. And, oh yes, yeah. And uh, we were talking about that because he's going into a sentencing phase now, and they're mm-hmm. I think when is it? Uh, they had a hearing. Uh, they had a hearing about when when it was going to they were going to do victim witness impacts. You remember his son mm-hmm. testified. And they were yes. wondering if the son was going to offer up a victim witness, whether it would be pro dad or pro mom. And you know, you think about that case, that's a horrific case. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the kid that found the body, the dad probably set it up that way. And not only did she, you know, the dad tried to say that she, you know, had uh, died of a single impalement and had fallen mm-hmm. back on this thing. And obviously she had been uh, attacked right. with a single twice. And right. left it buried in her back. So mm-hmm. I say all of this just to make the point that, um, uh, you know, the I don't know that the the Peterson case would rise to the level that it has gotten to now if it occurred today, because there's so many. No, I things. agree. No, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. Um, because it's certainly not as strange as like the Vallow case or even Leticia Stauk or even Watts, you know, Chris Watts for, for heaven's sakes, that was shocking. You know, that was absolutely shocking. I didn't even follow that case because I just wasn't, I, I, I don't know. I didn't want to, I didn't want to hear about it for the longest time. I just, yeah, you I, know, couldn't I wish, I, wish I didn't, it. I wish I didn't have to hear it. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I wish I had not heard it, <laughs> but you know, there's certain things and I'll give you right. a quick example and so the listeners kind of get where I'm coming from when, when I was, when we were in the middle, I don't know if it was the Arias case or what case it was. And I was going over to HLN regularly uh. sitting, I'd be sitting in what they call and folks at home don't realize this, but I'll explain to you the way it works at news networks. You have what are called flash studios and there's these little boxes that you go and you sit in and there's a, mm-hmm. a green screen behind you and it'll put up an image. And I mean, it's really tiny and you have like a, a, a little robotic camera that's in there with you, but you have right. an earpiece in. So you're yes. hearing the entire show. You're also hearing everything that's going on behind the, and something that put me off so bad, for instance, there's certain things that I can't listen to. And it's mm-hmm. like ever since the thing happened with Jared from Subway, I I have since his conviction and since before I have never eaten another Subway sandwich because I got to tell you I think there was an awareness. Right. Uh, oh yeah. I had to listen to that damn phone call over and over and over in my IP oh my God. where he's talking to the mother that you know that set him up and and all sorts of things and I you know every I wanted to run out of the little studio and go find a trash can and vomit in it vomit in right so so horrible so we we, you know i don't know that we get desensitized or or what the case might be but these cases are they're running rampant now back you know and i I don't want to steal your thunder here but you asked me to talk about thoughts about peterson because i was on the air last week uh with law and crime when this kind of broke and Mm -hmm. i've never you know i've over the course of my career, when I was a younger man, I was a 
big, big fan of the, of the death penalty. And okay. I, um, and for me, as I've gotten older and I've kind of seen things a little bit mm -hmm. differently, and it doesn't mean I have right or wrong answers. It's just for me personally, from a spiritual standpoint and, and other things, I am not as big of a fan of it. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you why. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I'm involved in media so much now. Yes. And I despise people like him so much that <clears throat> I never want to hear his name again. And I yes. it gets to the point where I hope that the, or I hope that it gets to a point where the general public never wants to hear his name again. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of things like they're saying that he's not going to receive the death penalty and that there's going to be another hearing and all that sort of thing. Now it's back in again, but the system is so screwed up that if you don't go for death penalty without possibility of parole, if you just go to a life sentence with possibility of parole or without, even without a possibility of parole, a lot of these jerks still wind up being able to appeal. Yep. And there is that, that yes. chance that they're going to get out. Yes. So, you know, if it was engineered in a different way, I hate to sound mm -hmm. engineered. That sounds like people are planning, but, um, if, if it was set up in such a way that, look, we are guaranteed and we, we know that he'll never see the light of day again, mm -hmm. let us never mention his name again. Right. And, and no, I agree. That would, be, that would be fine. You know, and you just yeah. kind of say next and the next person mm -hmm. rolls in. But now we're talking many years down range after the fact, and we've got to talk about this guy again. Right. Uh, no, I, I agree. And I, I'll be honest with you. I did not in my, I, you know, I, I agree with you on the death penalty. Um, I have softened a lot on the death penalty if, over the years. Um, it's not to say I don't believe in the death penalty still. Right. I don't, I don't believe it in all cases. Um, I think that it has to be a really big smoking gun. Okay. Because there's so many that are not, that are, that, that are just, like as the case of Rodney Reed down in Texas that we've dealt with, that is absolutely 100% wrongful conviction. And that guy is on death row and could die, you know, could, could have been put to death at any point in time yeah. for 23 years. So my time, my, I mean, but when I was younger, when I was a younger girl and I got my first uh, jury summons, I mean, the first thing that one of the things they asked me was, do you believe in cap capital punishment? And I was being flippant and said, yeah, fry them, fry them all. You know, I don't feel that way now. And I certainly really didn't feel that way then. I was just being, I just wanted out of jury duty. And I knew that would be, okay, bye. You know, if you're asking me, nope, fry them, fry them all. Okay, excuse me. Don't have to do this, you know? So, um, well, no, I gotta tell you, Fancy. I think that. Listen, I, I I have to give. I have to. I have to say this about families, and I've sat in the mm -hmm. living room with a lot of families over the years. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for these families, right. and I, I can't speak to their rage. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, you know, they're. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an old verse in the Bible they're talking. You know, actually, I think it had to do with Cain and Abel, and you know, God said to uh, said to Cain, you know, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, and yes, and so. You know, you think about that and you think about it in this context, these people are living day in and day out mm -hmm. um, with, you know, with, they want some comeuppance, if you will. They, yes. you know, we want blood for blood, you know, eye for mm -hmm. eye. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and I can't, I can't deny them that. Deny them that. I can't, no. but I, me as a, and if it was, uh, if it was one of my kinfolks relations, mm -hmm. yeah. if you will. I might have different, you know, a different view of it, but I just yes. know that because I see, like you were saying, mm -hmm. about Reed, I see so much stuff in forensics now mm -hmm. and we've, we've had a lot of ugh, really bad cases that have been found yes. out recently. Yes. Yes. It really, and particularly if the, if the police are totally reliant on old forensic evidence like that, mm -hmm. one of the things I urge all of the listeners to do is to take a long look at Dr. Michael West, who has been appearing mm -hmm. uh, in this Netflix series. He's a forensic odontologist who wound up uh, uh, being an integral part of the conviction of two gentlemen in Mississippi for the, the rape and killing of two little eight-year-old girls. They were like eight, and it was based on bite mark. And it's one of the reasons that bite mark is considered invalid science now. Yes. And, uh, you know, and I can get into that separately mm -hmm. with you at some other point in time, why right. bite mark was questionable. Sure. 
But suffice it to say, for years and years, people thought that, you know, uh, that bite mark evidence had come down from the burning bush and that, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's science and that it's confirmed. Mm -hmm. and that right. And, and if you really want a showstopper and you really want to make people ang angry, just mention Ted Bundy to them. Because, oh God, yeah. because the lion's share of the, the evidence and what was so salacious about it was, uh, was the fact that he had bitten a lot of people. He's, yes. uh, there's a proclivity called, uh, I'm, I know I'm going to say it wrong, but I think it's called, uh, um, bast, is it bastophilia? It's a, it's, uh, one of the paraphilias and it has to do with torture through biting. Yes, and, yes, yes, yes. And, you know, you look at that and if that was the sole nail in his coffin, you right. know, then that that's tough. That's really right. tough. And that's, what you're, yeah. that's why you need a complete investigation. You just don't need science. Mm -hmm. You need something substance. Right. Don't get me wrong. I know, I know a lot of the old guys that worked those cases with Bundy and I don't know a lot of them. I know a few of them, but yeah. they had good investigative. Oh, absolutely. They had done in addition to the bite mark. I'm just using that as an example. No, exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> but you know, when I when like I was saying though, you know, when I said, when I started to say was that, you know, we were talking about cases and things that we wanted to cover. And Colleen was like, I want to cover Scott Peterson. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And she's like, and then her next sentence was, I think he's totally innocent. And I was like, excuse me, what? What did you say? I didn't think there was anybody on earth who thought that. Um, besides his parents, you know, and, his, and one of his sisters, not the other sister, because she wrote a book that said, my, 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 why my brother did it, you know? So um, I was like, are you serious? Or, and Colleen is a very intelligent person. So I was just like, huh? How can you possibly even consider this? And, you know, and she, well, she did a great job on her, her episode. You know, she went through a lot of the facts of um, things that the family has brought up of, of different stuff. And it's obviously a lot of his habeas corpus, you know, um, and, and all of that. But to me, it still seems like when I sat down and looked at it, and like I said earlier, you know, I looked at this very psychologically. Um, most of my impression about this case is all behavioral, um, because you can contend whether or not someone saw her at 1030 or 1050, or was it Tuesday or was it Wednesday? Okay, that all of those things to me were very like, like, and this is a very circumstantial case and most cases are circumstantial, you know, but, but a lot of this case was based on things that could have been one way or the other. But for me, when you take all that away and you really look at who he is as a person and the things that he did and the behaviors that he exhibited, there aren't any questions. There, it, it just is what it is. It, 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 it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck. It, it, it's, it's a duck, you know? And so for me, that's always been the way I've looked at this. And that was the approach I took. I told him, I told everybody, I wasn't going to go through the timeline and all these different things because I broke it all down to very scientific, psychological, you know, profiling. And um, because that's the way I've always looked at things anyway. I, I am very a psychological person in these cases. I always want to know what's in their brains. What are they doing? Why do they do this? You know, that's always been my thing. So when we talked about this, you know, her coming in the water or not, I really, that was the one thing that I don't understand because I don't, I don't know anything about currents or could this happen in the water? So my question for you, you know, here is, is this the injuries that she sustained? Is it actually something that could have actually happened in the water? Yeah, it's possible there. You know, you have a lot mm -hmm. of rocky outcroppings, this sort of thing. The body is, mm -hmm. is very fragile, you know, at this right. point. Uh, and again, though, <laughs> your timeline gets all skewed and thrown. And, and I think a lot of people, they want to come and worship at the altar of forensic science and say, mm -hmm. Oh mighty one, give us all of the answers. And that ain't, that ain't going to be the case because they bought right. into, they bought into a, a bill of goods with that, that mm -hmm. that's not going to be the case. Sometimes, sometimes you, you ask questions that cannot be answered sure. in, in the absolute, you know, it's just, right it's not possible. You can, you can best guess it, best guess it. And it's going to be circumstantial anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, you know, it's the old, the old adage about somebody that's shot while they're standing in front of a clock and the bullet passes through, hits a clock and the clock stops at the moment of death. I still don't buy it. it right. 
You're going to, because I don't know if there was something wrong with the clock beforehand. I wasn't there. So you you have to to be very purpose. You have to be very careful. And again, Mm -hmm. going back to what you were saying, I think it's a, it's a salient point. Um, You think about Chris Watts and you think about Scott Peterson and this whole, I'll never forget watching that videotape of when, <clears throat> when uh, uh, Shanann, you know, told him that she, that they, you know, she showed the pregnancy test and his reaction in that moment, um, it was, you know, it was not, you know, thank God, honey, we're having another bundle of joy. It no. was, <laughs> yeah, this, this sounds wonderful. You I know, it just, kidding. and, and <laughs> therein lays, and again, that's all speculative. Mm-hmm. It's completely speculative. But, you know, these two guys, there are not that many degrees of separation. No, not at all. has an eye for the ladies, Mm -hmm. among others. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, and so you you have a guy that might feel like he's trapped Mm -hmm. in a relationship. He does not Mm -hmm. get out of it. And sometimes, you know, the worst of the worst happens in these cases. And I think it did in both of these cases. I I absolutely think in both cases in that – that but was what is, I. This is the last thing I'll say, but because mm-hmm. therein mm-hmm. lies the problem, because of the lack mm-hmm. of lack of more concrete evidence relative to um, his uh, pre premeditative, Patient. you know, thoughts mm-hmm. and all this. Mm-hmm. I I do, from a logical standpoint, understand why they backed off on the death penalty. Now we'll see what I do. Happens. I do understand that. Yeah. yeah, I understood that too. And I told and, and I had told Colleen she had given me enough pause to think about maybe the death penalty wasn't appropriate. Um, I think he got the death penalty based on the fact of Connor, um, not Bate Lacey. And one of the things I brought up, you know, you said something about the fact of them feeling trapped and um you know, I brought that up in what I was talking about in, in my my part of the, the four-part series that we did over on the Good Wives Guide to True Crime. Um, I brought that up in the fact of that he is tendencies of a no- narcissistic sociopath. Um, he grew up in an environment where his mother um, gave him the precedent of one, he could do nothing wrong. He was a little prince. And two, um, he also grew up in an environment where his mother had given up several children for adoption. And so that gave him the idea that if you don't want something, you just get rid of it. Right. And so I thought I saw Lacey as being um, a threat to that because um, now Cotter was going to come along and, and pull her focus. You know, and yeah. she would no longer be focused on him. She would be focused on this baby and he would take a second thing. So, you know, I think he kind of looked at her as just getting rid of something that was not, not attractive to him anymore. And the way I think he thought about Connor, I don't think he even considered Connor a, a, a thing because it wasn't a, he wasn't a living, breathing, tangible thing to him. So it didn't matter. Like, oh, well, I'll just get rid of it. You know, well, everybody's like, well, he was happy to have a baby. No, I don't think he was happy to have a baby at, at all. Um, and, and it comes through in many of the things that he said and did and how he behaved. And, 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 and like you said, yeah, maybe it's not concrete in, you know, this is this and that is that, and there was blood on the floor and there was this and the thing, and there's the knife, you know, but when you put it all together, it really does seem to me, there's no question that this is what happened. Um, you know, you can talk about the people across the street that there were, you know, Colleen came up with some really weird thing and we're going to actually talk about it in the fourth episode when we all kind of come back for our round table. Well, she was talking about how these people across the street were robbers, you know, and then she know, she went out and she confronted them. And then she went back in the house. She didn't call anybody. She didn't call 911. She didn't call her parents. She didn't call her husband. She didn't notify the people's home that was being robbed. And she goes upstairs, she takes a shower, comes back down, goes out and walks the dog. And now they take her? Like, what are you talking about? That makes absolutely no sense. How can you even possibly make that a plausible argument? I, and I have to know what her answer is because I, that, that does not make any sense to me. Like there is no realm in which that makes sense to me, especially not a pregnant woman at eight months pregnant. I know my daughter is seven months pregnant right now. There is no way she would have walked outside and done that. First of all, she probably wouldn't have confronted him. And second of all, um, she would have called the police or her husband or me or somebody like, daddy, please bring the shotgun over here. I'm really scared, you know, <laughs> but it certainly wouldn't have been, I'm going to go take a shower and go walk my dog. 
what, what eight month, what eight, 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 uh, woman in eight month of pregnancy has the energy to do that. <laughs> to do any of that, right? Like she, it was said that she wasn't even walking the dog anymore because of that, you know? Yeah. And, and so I'm sitting here thinking to myself, you know, it just doesn't make sense when you put things together. I, I mean, I understand they want it to not be, but I just don't see how it can't be like there's nothing that makes sense to me other than this um now the only other thing that that people have talked about like you said was connor do you now based on the evidence do you believe that he was you know it, it, he it was expelled while she was in the water at some time or do you think that there was a, a possibility that he was already um out of her um, womb before you know before being killed i think that it's very difficult to determine that i uh, mm -hmm. However, what what makes me think that this was probably a coffin birth is the fact that his body was intact, pretty much, uh, mm -hmm. that he wasn't what we refer to as um, macerated uh, right. mm -hmm. you know, to the point where he's, his little body was destroyed. Uh, you know, obviously, he was not, you know, his remains were not in good shape, um, you know, when the people found him there on the shore. But mm -hmm. it's... <clears throat> The fact that, you know, little babies as, you know, as all of us that are parents in the audience, you know, understand mm -hmm. very delicate, they're very fragile. Yes. And the fact that he was intact, I think, mm -hmm. he, mm -hmm. as much as he could be in that environment, I think says a lot. And it gives us an indication scientifically that more than likely this was a coffin birth, mm -hmm. um, you know, does does it does the possibility exist that she could have had a spontaneous miscarriage at the moment when she was being killed which by the way we don't have a definitive cause of death with her if people will go back and review they right. just you know, they they ruled it they ruled mm -hmm. the cause of death is undetermined right and but classified it as a homicide and yes there's a big difference between cause and manner and manner, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. There are just, there's five manners and homicide is one of them. Causality. Mm -hmm. Causality is something, you know, akin to blunt force trauma, gunshot wound, incised injury. You know, mm -hmm. that's where there's mm -hmm. nothing that, that the forensic pathologist could hang their proverbial hat on in this case. And that's why they left this open ended. So with that said, um, do I think that more than likely, uh, Connor was in utero when she went in the, went mm -hmm. in the water? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think that's I probably, too. and then he became separated from her, um, you know, and of course you talked about tides, the tides in this case, mm -hmm. tides and times, those are, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and times, you know, tides are actually one of mankind's oldest sources for telling time. Yes. And so it's, you know, isn't it interesting how this case is so heavily dependent upon the post-mortem interval. You talk about the flow of water, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the rising and falling of the tide and right. where, where these two individuals, and I'm talking mm -hmm. about Lacey and her, and her baby, where mm -hmm. they wound up. And that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's a curious bit. That's a curious bit of business. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, there, yeah, like I said, there's not that there's not, there's not questions. I just think that there's not questions because like you said, there's not definitive answers based on science, you know, but there are definitive answers based on other things. And when you put it, especially in a very highly circumstantial case, I think when it, it's a, it's a theory, series of, if A, then B, and if B, then C, and if C, then D, then it must be, you know, and, and so you kind of lay out this, this, the story, it, it's a story, and, and if the story fits, you know, whoever tells the better story, and it makes the most sense, then that's who, right. that's who ultimately wins, and in this case, ultimately, the, the prosecution laid a very, very compelling case, yes, um, and, you know, you There's can talk about, worry. yeah, yeah, I mean, there, you can talk about a one juror going in as, a, as an alternate and convincing people, but I even told Colleen, I was like, okay, honey, I can believe that they might have been able to convince maybe two, three, four, five people, 
what they didn't hold a gun to anybody's head and say you have to vote for the death penalty or that he's guilty. Um, she went in there, she gave, she made her case, and everybody agreed. Nope, we agree. This is true. So you know, I don't think she could have convinced an entire jury that you know that he was guilty and deserved the death penalty all by her little lonesome. You know, I think that that had to be very strong there. Um, I think could, so too, and and that, yeah. that also goes to another point, you know, mm -hmm. you never can measure what the influence of anybody is in one of those damn jury rooms anyway. Right, right. Uh, to what degree does it influence? Because listen, there's discussions, mm -hmm. you know, that right. go on, that's, that's part of the, mm -hmm. the process of debate. You know, we, we mm -hmm. live and work within this system that our forefathers handed down. They set it up based right. on the English common law system. And so mm -hmm. the idea that that you go in to argue and to debate these points is critical. So yes, you have, unless you have some type of specific evidence that mm -hmm. somebody, I, I, you know, one of the, one of the great regrets in my life is that <clears throat> um, as a, um, a former forensic practitioner, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I am, I'm not going to say barred, <laughs> but I've gone, I've, I've been in the jury pool multiple times mm -hmm. and it's been one of my believe it or not some people roll their eyes but for me it's been one of my great desires to serve on jury That's something <laughs> I, I would love to i would love to do it now i did not want to do it in my 20s like i, would, you know. I think it's a it's a noble duty and it's yes. like it's okay with voting and, mm -hmm. and yeah you know, absolutely country and all those sorts of things and you know for me um mm -hmm. i have it's something I always wanted to do, but you know, and to this point, when they hear what my credentials are, not that I'm anything great, that I'm a better person than anybody else. But the problem is, is that if, if you're handling a crime against persons, if you're handling anything that involves forensics and they find out mm -hmm. what my background is, I'm automatically dismissed in the first, <laughs> you know, in the, year, in the first right. round. Right. You know, right. And I, 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 I took it to heart many times. I was thinking, my God, put me on a civil jury. Just let me do a divorce. <laughs> I just want to serve, you know. But right. all it takes is all it takes is one person to go into into that jury room and mm -hmm. begin to sway the jury. The trick is this: How are you going to be able to tell what was said? Right, with you don't the know jury? because right. there is no transcript of what's going right. on in there. Right, sure, sure. You know, and, and then whatever it is that they may or may not have said, how is that actually going to influence? Well, right. You now look, you get one strong personality in there, mm. and they're they're it's their it's within human nature. If you got a strong personality, you're going to influence the group because you're going to run your mouth and you're going to state your business. Oh, yeah, absolutely, right. Somebody else that's not quite as inclined to argue, they're going to be passive and sit back. And at the end of the day, they begin to think about it and say, "Well, I got influenced. I didn't have an opportunity to." you know, to place my vote and say what I should have said. Well, you know, the proverbial cow's out of the barn at that point. Right. No, exactly. And see, I've been barred three times. You know, I said the first one was Brian Frymel. The second one was, um, you know, asking me if uh, I had any law enforcement background or was I related to anybody in law enforcement. And I was like, well, besides the fact that I'm taking criminal justice courses and my dad is a career cop and blah, blah, blah. Da, da, would you like anything else? And they were like, dismissed. But the one that I found the most interesting, and it kind of speaks to what you're talking about, of they dismiss you based on your qualifications. This was the one that was the most interesting thing that was asked to me. So um, the the defense attorney came up and said, so if you were to have popping across a crime scene and, you know, the crime tape was out and uh, there was a stretcher out with a white white uh, sheet over the top of something that appeared to be a body and there was a chalk outline on the on the ground, what would you say was on the the, um, the the stretcher and I said well a, a body like and he's like nope dismissed and I thought to myself well, what did you want me to say a dog like I mean it, it, it obviously by deductive reasoning I would assume you know I mean unless you give me some other indication of why it isn't a body I, I would think it might be a body you know and so I was dismissed obviously right away you know because of that and I was like well obviously I have a brain god forbid you put a person with a brain on a jury because oh no she might be too too smart for everyone else you know and she might actually know what we're talking about you know? well, <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it, these folks at home don't understand that in these void ears 
And that is when they put you up in the box and they begin <laughs> in the yeah. jury box. They bring you in in groups of 12. Right. They begin to ask you questions. You know, these, mm -hmm. these attorneys, they, they have, there's several grounds on which they can uh, mm -hmm. strike. And I right. think they get four preemptive strikes where <laughs> they don't have to say anything. Say anything. They don't have nope. to say why they're striking. And then you have strike for cause. And mm -hmm. they have a limited number of those. So when you're going through this pool, if you've got a pool of, when you get one of these things in the mail, and depending mm -hmm. upon where you live in the country, there's going to be small pools or large pools. So if you're right. in a medium-sized town, you might be sitting in some, you know, dusty area and uh, reading a book. Make sure you take a book with you. Uh, <laughs> right, 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 right. Oh, God, thing. yes. But, you know, you're going to sit there for a long time, and you might be in a pool of 100 people. They're going to bring you in 12 at a time. Mm -hmm. And they're going to, you know, ask you all questions. Well, they have to know when to pull the proverbial trigger and right. strike any one individual. It right. used to be years ago where, uh, let's see, if you were a cop, obviously they would give pass to a nurse or a doctor because they saw them as like a critical need person that didn't need right. to be there. Mm -hmm. If you were an attorney, uh, and mm -hmm. I can't remember what else there were a couple other things you know people that automatically disqualify you could, you could actually call in to the clerk mm -hmm. of the office and say this is reverend so-and-so or this is right. dr so -so. I, I i don't want to be part of jury duty and back then they would say okay, okay. you're good to go, right. doctor and but mm -hmm. nowadays they'll bring them in too so it's it's changing a little bit but mm -hmm. not to the way of my life Right. Well, I thank you for talking about Scott Peterson and everything, but I do see something behind your head there, and I'd love to know what is that and what is going on. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, see if you can see it. I don't know if you can. If, <laughs> we can kind of read not, part of it. <laughs> if people are not familiar with it, uh, there is actually uh, a new uh, true crime television network, and it's called uh, The true crime network it used to be the justice network and now it's called the true crime network if people will go there and visit it uh it's uh, you would not believe the shows that they have they've they've acquired all of the all of the episodes of one of my favorite programs of all time which was city confidential oh and i love that there, show and yeah it's one of the original it's one of the best um at any rate uh relative to this program this mm -hmm. program Mm -hmm. I, feel like I feel like I'm a weatherman. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, back in, um, uh, I'll give people a real brief story. Back uh, last summer, uh, uh, I got a phone call from um, from a uh, an exchange in Australia, mm -hmm. and this lady comes on the phone with a very thick lovely but thick Australian accent and she asked me uh you know are you Joseph Morgan you know and I was like <laughs> <laughs> and she said uh well you know we're we're here at your university and we've been talking to the chief legal counsel of mm -hmm. the university who is a former judge mm -hmm. and he recommended you we're actually interviewing him about the Marie Hilly case and for those that don't know anything about Marie Hilly, look her up. She actually appears on this program. And, uh, and she asked the judge, who is the legal counsel for the university, do you have anybody here uh, that teaches forensics? And he told her, he says, yeah, there's this guy that's here at the university. And he's always on Nancy Grace's show. Well, she called me up and, she, you know, we began to talk and she said, uh, you know, because even in Australia, they know who Nancy is. And she, she said, oh, yeah. so true that you know Nancy Grace? You know, I was like, yes, ma'am. I'm on her show regularly. She says, brilliant. <laughs> she says, <laughs> brilliant. We, we want you to know about this case. Well, this case, the, the Marie Hilly case, which is absolutely bonkers, bananas case, if no one has ever, ever uh, heard of it. It was actually tried in 83, oh. um, but it involves false identities. It involves poisoning your husband and your kids and a woman on the lam. So uh, they interviewed me about that. They enjoyed what I had to say about that and wound up 
taping four interviews here on on campus with them mm-hmm. and then wound up flying out to LA and filming my participation in the bulk of the rest of the series. But the name of the show is called Poisonous Liaisons. And uh, if you go to the uh, True Crime Network website and look under all of their shows, Poisonous mm-hmm. Liaisons is one of the ones that has recently been uh, acquired by them it was first we began showing in october in the uk and ireland and australia on the ci channel which is like their version of id discovery okay uh discovery id as a matter of fact i think they're kind of in cahoots with one another Mr. Uh, channels, yeah but uh anyway uh the true crime network acquired the rights to poisonous liaisons and it premiered earlier this month. And the cool thing about it and what I'm going to tell you is if you go to their website, click on the Poisonous Liaisons link, there's 13 episodes you can watch all of them for free. And yeah. you, don't, you don't have to have you don't have to have the True Crime Network on your cable provider, on your satellite provider, or whatever the case might be. Streaming is free. There's not going to be any kind of sign up or anything like that. Just nice. go there and each episode is an hour long. There's two cases on each episode. Now keep in mind Many of these cases are out of Australia. You'll have some of them that are from the UK, but there is a large number of them uh, mm-hmm. from the United States. My particular favorite one is episode six, and it uh, is a case that was actually featured many years ago on City Confidential. We dig into it a little bit more, and it's it's about Ann Jet Lyles, who owned a cafeteria, a cafe in Macon, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the most hideous cases that you'll ever come across. One of the most cold hearted and brutal cases you'll ever come across. I urge everybody to go there. It's actually episode six, but watch all of them, but check out episode six. It's fascinating. It is true Southern Gothic uh, in in the purest sense. And uh, I'm not going to say it's up there with uh, midnight in the garden of good and evil, but there's a lot of evil. It's got voodoo in it. Uh, it's got the African American wait staff that was back in the fifties that was afraid to say anything about a white lady that was poisoning mm. her family and they sent mm-hmm. a notes. It's got everything. Please, I beg you, go and check it out. And right. uh, you know, we want to uh, want everybody to come and view. Well, you definitely hit my button with Southern Gothic. I, I've actually written my own um series like a it's not true crime it's actual fiction but it's a crime series and it is southern gothic it's that in georgia in the south uh you know uh in savannah and then um it goes all the way back to it deals with serial killers and going all the way back to like the plantation days so um and we kind of cover it all it's really it's really I, I i love the series i can't wait for it to get out there um we're we're in the process of waiting for you know covid to stop <laughs> We had four different things going at the time that COVID started and then um, everything just went and it's like sitting there, you know, so um, hopefully though things are starting to come back and I think that there's going to be a rise of um, streaming stuff that is going to really take off. You know, we have a lot of true crime projects that we're working on. Um, One of them being, you know, that I wanted to work on with you was the Delphi murders, you know, and do a full documentary on that because I really think that is a solvable case. Um, it is. Oh, and by the way, I've got a piece of news about that today in case. People yes, yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> actually, uh, and I might get this wrong. Let me make sure I got it right. The mm-hmm. fellow uh, that is the state superintendent for the Indiana State Police that we saw so much of at the end, inter- he announced he's retiring today. And oh. so that uh, that uh, I'm friends with uh, with Kelsey, uh, mm-hmm. who's Liv- Libby's sister. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kelsey dropped dropped the girls off at the, at the right. trust that day. And she, she actually posted some stuff on her social media today that, you know, I'm sure that, you know, and I know the families, uh, mm-hmm. pretty well, uh, yeah. particularly yeah. his granddaddy know him mm-hmm. very well. And, yeah. um, you need to, if you pray, I would advise you to pray for them because I'm sure that their anxiety mm-hmm. level has gone through the roof of yes. the fact that man has announced because he's so, He's so committed to this case. All these people yeah. are. Yeah. And, you know, I think that everybody, yeah. everybody fears that it's just going to fade into, fade into. Yeah. Back. And I don't want that to happen. 
We're hoping I don't want to happen. And I think that uh, we just did an interview today with Dr. Laura Petler. And I think if we were to imp it, uh, apply some of her murder room, um, uh, you know, applications that that we might be able to actually get some sort of idea of more information to solve that case, you know, because her murder room, uh, God, that is such a great way of looking at cases. I, I she yeah. explained it all to us today and we will be releasing that, you know, shortly here. Um, and she's going to be one of our new regular guests and we are so excited to have her. Um, and, Karen, and then Karen Stark is also starting to, is going to be starting with us too. So I'm so impressed with the, the rounded out, you know, a panel of experts we have here because you guys are always so wonderful and so informative and I just really thank you. But yes, I definitely want to talk to you about let's get, a documentary actually going with that because we really yeah. need to you know because that that case just deserves to be be solved and and it I does. and I think it's one of those that we really could make an impact if we sat in and really went forward with it you know that there because I, I definitely think somebody knows who that guy is like I, I think they just know and they need to come all community very small yeah. community mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I don't think that it's it's a fluke I don't I don't think it was just a weird one off or something odd. I think that I've always been of the opinion that uh, uh, whoever did this had a familiarity with the fact that kids would be at school that day. Yes, yes. And, and that was a hot spot for them to go, children, yeah. uh, teens and, to go and hang out. And the weather, you know, up in mm -hmm. that part of the country, that time of year, you don't, you don't get a lot of lovely days. And it was a no. lovely day. And yes. it was, they, even though it was in kind of the heart of winter, you know, that it was described mm -hmm. as like an early spring day and, you know, mm -hmm. people get restless when they get, they get all held up in the house. Obviously now in this context we're in today, but you know, you see a pretty day out there. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to get out and enjoy it when it's not bleak and cold and blistering. Right. Cold. Right. Uh, right. It's uh, it was just one of those perfect days. And of course it turned mm -hmm. out to be a complete horror story. You know, that wouldn't be a bad name for it. A lovely day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You're right. So anyway, thank you again so much for joining us. I can't, you know, I wait to have you back again, always. I mean, you are yep. just such a wonderful, pleasant person to, to discuss you. such morbid, horrible things. <laughs> well, that said, I want to tell everybody out there, somebody mm -hmm. out there is having a tough day, go and be kind to somebody. And that's what Absolutely. you need. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay? I'll see you guys down the tracks. All right. Alrighty. Bye. All right. Bye. Well, thanks so much for tuning in and dishing true crime with the Good Wives and Murder by Design. Don't forget to join our Patreon member club to get exclusive mini episodes, inside documents and pictures from the case, live YouTube discussions, our exclusive discussion group on Facebook, and get some amazing Good Wives merch. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at True Crime Wives. And for more inside information, check out our podcast, The Good Wives Guide to True Crime, on any of your favorite podcast players. Have a good one from the Good Wives. Serving up true crime one dish at a time.